So the question then is not what, or what differentiates the relational perspective is not the idea of learning from the patient. You know, we have that mm -hmm. very lovely idea from Casement and we have it from others mm -hmm. uh, in object relations theory. The difference is in thinking that we don't just learn from the patient in the sense that the patient says something and then we figure out what it means, but that we actually do some of the figuring out allowed with the patient, not only so they can correct us, but I yes. think so that we can have the emotional input. I think so that we can have the affective experience that in turn gives them the affective experience that they are changing us. Yes. As well as we are changing them. So when we explore what happened, what went wrong between us, and we have a whole emotional experience together and we see that we each change each other that repair of rupture has a different kind of function and meaning than if we just go off by ourselves figure it out and then say to the patient i think this is what you were trying to communicate and this is what i should have said or this is what i now want to say and it doesn't have that emotional balance at all yeah. of having gone through something together well this is how i understood you using the word aliveness i mean yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That were that were real. It's sort of a, a real, alive way of being together in the process. Yeah, that's my goal: is to be able to tolerate doing that without, you know, being too buffeted. That is, I'm always trying to increase my window hmm. uh, so that I can tolerate having more of the affect of, say, shame or self-criticism, or I can tolerate having more disappointment or more anxiety without uh, losing the connection to the third, the connection to that place where we not only observe, but we also really interconnect implicitly, rhythmically with the other person. Because when I'm losing my observing power, I'm also generally speaking losing my ability to stay connected with you. Because I'm off in my own head, you know, worrying about what I just did. So I, I try to look like I'm still there, but really, I'm really gone. I'm worrying. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, I mean, it sounds like I mean I, I couldn't I couldn't put it as beautifully as you as you just did that the, the unconscious is very much present you know, in in the relational work. It's um it's present all the time, whether we want it to be or not. I think the thing is we we differ in our ways of analyzing it. And one of the things that I've found is that, and, and we all find this over and over, when you present a case or somebody else presents a case and people start to work on it together, they invariably come up with more stuff. It doesn't matter how terrifically you think you analyze something and you want to present it to a group. Don't present it to a group if you want it to stay the way it was. It's not going to stay the way it was. The group is going to change it. The group is going to, I mean, for one thing, they, you know, everybody wants to show that they can do this thing. But, you know, everybody's going to find other little threads and, and to pull on. And, and it's going to pull the material in this way and that way. And, you know, yank it around and different shapes are going to emerge. And it's going to not only clarify different things, but bring up different things in the person. Sometimes very big, surprising new things, but in any event, always something. And that process is what I think we have to engage in constantly in order to be humbled about how much we can know at any given moment, right? And knowing is so state determined. And being in a supportive group changes one state, and being in interaction with somebody who's very imaginative changes one state, and so on and so forth. So, all of those things determine what we might call access to the unconscious.